On April 10th, 2022, a Moser Rides drop tower at Sydney's Royal Easter Show was operating normally. The kids' drop tower was loaded with riders. The restraint OK light on the control panel illuminated and the ride operator started the ride. The ride began its normal cycle with one rider, a four-year-old, completely unrestrained, with their harness well above their head. Onlookers shouted to the ride operator to stop the ride. The ride operator pressed the emergency stop button as the ride was beginning to climb, causing it to stop about two meters in the air. Onlookers then jumped the fencing around the ride to help the unrestrained rider off the ride. Everyone escaped without injuries, but several failures occurred, resulting in a near miss. In the amusement industry, a near miss is defined as an event that given a shift in timing or placement could have resulted in damage to property, injury, or loss of life. This can be visualized with Heinrich's Accident Triangle, which states that for every 300 accidents with no injuries, there are 29 minor accidents and one major accident. Though these numbers have been debated, the general principle holds true. Accordingly, in this new series, we'll be taking a look at amusement industry near misses, seeing what lessons can be learned to hopefully prevent major accidents in the future. Going back to this specific situation, the ride involved was a Moser Ride Spring. This type of small drop tower uses a simple pulley system to create fun pops of airtime and is designed for smaller riders. The investigation into the near miss would be carried out by SafeWork NSW, a local government agency. The investigation would seek to determine why the ride had been allowed to start with the harness released. The ride itself featured five seats on each side of the tower for a total of 10 seats on the ride. Riders are restrained with a ratcheting style shoulder harness that could adjust to a few different positions for each individual rider. Inside each seat, each restraint was fitted with a limit switch that would only be triggered when that individual restraint was in the minimum locking position. On this ride, that position was three clicks of the ratchet device. Once the restraint was as low as the third click, the limit switch would engage and send a signal back to the ride's control system. Under normal circumstances, the ride would need this signal from all 10 restraints in order for the ride to start. The ride featured a restraint indicator light on the operator's control panel that would illuminate if all restraints were lowered to at least the minimum position. All of the inputs from the ride's sensors and control panel fed back to an electrical cabinet featuring a PLC-based control system near the ride. The investigators examined the ride and found that the restraint OK light would remain illuminated even with some of the restraints not in the minimum locked position. They opened up the ride's control cabinet and began testing the inputs from the seat limit switches. It was found that on some of the limit switches a short circuit had occurred resulting in them always reporting that the restraint was in the proper position, regardless of its actual position. This is why the restraint indicator light had been illuminated and the ride had been allowed to start by the control system, despite the restraint not actually being lowered. The investigators determined that this short circuit was likely due to simple wear and tear and was not done intentionally. According to Moser Rides, riders above 42 inches or 106 centimeters were permitted to ride. Interestingly, Moser Rides released an optional service bulletin in 2006 detailing a modification that could be performed to existing spring rides to allow them to lower their height requirement to 36 inches or about 91 centimeters. This involved adding new bulkier restraint harnesses. At the time of the incident, this ride had not performed the modification. It's not clear what the ride's height requirement was set to but it's not uncommon for a four-year-old rider to be about 42 inches or 106 centimeters. So it is likely that the child was tall enough to ride the unmodified design when operated properly. The focus then moved to the operation of the ride. Why had the ride's operator not noticed that a rider's restraint was completely released? Due to the ride's design of having riders seated on both sides of the tower, the ride operator's position for operating the ride was located to the side of the tower in a location where they could theoretically see both sides of the ride at once. This position did have some blind spots. The seats opposite to the ride operator's position were especially hard to see. On many rides with blind spots, mirrors are installed to allow for better viewing. These were not present on this ride at the time of the incident. Additionally, there was no consistent procedure in place for operators to check restraints. 
details released from the investigation on the extent of operator training are scarce, but it is known that there was no official policy on how or when restraints should be checked. The only image we have from the incident was taken moments after the ride was stopped. From this, we can see that the operator had a very limited view of the rider that was not restrained. Additionally, we can see that the operator did not appear to have any way to contact a superior about the incident, and seemed not to have a plan for what to do after the emergency stop. From news sources, we know that shortly after this photo was taken, the operator remained at the control panel waiting for help, while onlookers jumped the ride's fence to get the child down off the ride. The operator's lack of preparedness and the view from the crowd that they were powerless likely caused the onlookers to feel compelled to jump the fence and enter the ride area, creating a second unsafe situation. There are quite a few things that can be learned from this near miss. Several factors came together to allow this incident to occur. Had the ride been in proper electrical condition, this incident would not have occurred. Had proper inspections of the ride safety system taken place, this incident would not have occurred. Had the ride operator checked every seat, this incident would not have occurred. Had the ride operator had a clear view of the rider's seat, this incident likely would not have occurred. It's clear from this that we can extract a few key takeaways. For manufacturers, it may be advisable to have rides with restraint sensors require that the control system see that the restraint has been cycled, opened, and closed prior to the start of a ride cycle. This avoids the possibility of a failed on sensor or a short circuit being present when the ride is started. For maintenance and inspectors, it's advisable to test each restraint sensor on rides that have them individually at regular intervals. This can be done by closing all restraints except for one and seeing if the restraint indicator light or equivalent comes on or if the ride cycle can be started. Additionally, Australia does not use the internationally maintained standards for rides provided by ASTM or EN. It may be advisable to partially or completely adopt one of these standards, as it would simplify the inspection process and standardize it with much of the rest of the world. For operators, proper, clear, and written procedures that are specific to operators' responsibilities and do not leave room for individual interpretation are needed. These procedures must be well understood by ride operators, and frequent checks for their understanding is needed. Clear emergency procedures are also needed, specifically what to do in a crisis after the ride is stopped. Finally, operators need to have a clear view of the ride they are operating at all times. All of these lessons can be applied to many parts of the attractions industry, and hopefully learning from this near miss can help prevent an actual accident in the future. With all that being said, if you'd like to learn more about this incident, the sources I used, including a very small incident report prepared by SafeWork NSW, are linked in the description. If you enjoyed this new style of video, let YouTube know by liking and subscribing so that these factual and educational videos are pushed to more people. If you're interested in ride safety, I have a page on my website dedicated to places where you can find more, and you can also contact me there. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.